All right, so this is the second part of the Pro's Lemlib tutorial. So in this part, we'll actually install Lemlib itself. If you haven't watched the first part, I recommend you watch that or some things in this video might be a bit confusing. So we need to actually import Lemlib into our project. So Lemlib's a library for Pro's, which adds a lot of features like PID, odometry, and other features not found in other templates like Easy Template. And in my opinion, it's really easy to set up. So to install it, we have to open the terminal first so you have to go on to the left here you have to scroll down all the way until you find pros here click on it and it should open this menu up go down click integrated terminal this is where you're gonna paste the commands that we'll copy down later and the documentation for this can also be found on here so it's this website for we've already done all of this in the first part so you don't need to do that and we need to copy these commands and paste it into the terminal so i'll copy this all right, I should say added depot from Lemlib. And now we need to paste the second command there. And it should say Lemlib has been successfully installed, but in this case, I already installed it. So you need to install it on a per project basis. So next we need to include the library at the top of our main.cpp file after installing it. So now it's added there. And in the next video, I'll show you how to configure the Lemlib template. Okay, so in this video, we'll be explaining how to use the example template for Lemlib. So this is basically just a simple project which has everything set up, including like odometry and PID. So you don't have to set it up yourself, but I'm going to show you what you need to change to fit your own bot. So you can go to this link, which will be in the description, and then you want to copy the raw text. So this is our old code, but I will just move it to a different file that we aren't using new file there okay now we can delete this and put in our sample all right so now that we have this pasted in we're gonna go from top to bottom and change the parameters to what we need it to be so left motors and right motors i explained this in the first tutorial but i'll go over it a bit again you can see my motors are here, three, four, five, and you can use this to see if they're going in the right direction. So this is moving backwards, but I'm telling it to go forwards. So I have to reverse motor three. Motor four is okay. And motor five is okay. So in my program, I'll put negative three, four, and then five. So let's do that. Change. Right motors to be negative three, four, and then five. And then do the same for the left. Eight is okay. Nine is reversed. And 10 is reversed. So eight, negative nine, negative 10. And then we can leave the motor gear set as blue because that's what I'm using in my 600 RPM drive base. So IMU is just the inertial sensor. So we can go back to devices here. You can see that my inertial sensor is in port 20. So I'll set this to be in port 20. All right, and then horizontal encoder. So these are your odometry wheels that you're using. So on this robot, you can see I have one vertical encoder. But if you had a horizontal one, it would be like this. But as we don't have a horizontal one, we'll only set the vertical one up. So how we do that is we'll just comment out horizontal encoder and then set our vertical encoder port, which is port 2. And then here we can comment it out because we don't have a horizontal. But of course, if you had one, you would change this to the right parameters that you need. So here's setting up the rotation sensor and this is setting up the tracking wheel. So it's setting the encoder to the vertical encoder that we defined in port two. The wheel diameter for mine is new two because it's a two inch omni wheel. So if you had, let's say a 2.75, you'd put 2.75. If you had 3.25, you put 325, but mine is 2 inch. So, and this distance is the distance in inches from your tracking center. So I'll show you what that means on the camera. The tracking center, the center of rotation for the drive base of your robot. So, for example, the tracking center of the 
vertical one would be between this and this wheel. So it would the tracking center would be if this is 10.5 inches, it'd be at 5.25 inches, which it already is. So our tracking offset would be zero. But if you add a horizontal encoder, say here, the horizontal tracking center would be between the front wheel, which is here, this one, and the back wheel, which is this one. So the tracking offset would be the distance from here to the middle of those two wheels, which would be around 4.5 inches. But since this is right in the middle of the robot, we don't have a tracking offset. As it's in, right in the middle, well, I'll set the distance to zero. But of course, if your tracking wheel is offset slightly, you have to change that. So this is setting up the drive base. So it's just saying left motors, right motors, which we defined earlier. And then the track width is the distance between the middle of your two wheels. So if I were to measure that on this robot, it'd be the middle of this Omni wheel here. The middle of this Omni wheel here, which is 10.5 inches. So I would set the track width to 10.5. Okay, and then wheel diameter, same as the tracking wheels, but for the wheels on your drive base. So mine's a 2.75 Omni wheel, so I put it new 275. And then RPM is the how fast your wheel spin. So it could be like 360, 450, or 600. So this will help it calculate the speed of your robot and horizontal drift is how slow you're willing to go to have more accuracy if you have omni wheels because if you have omni wheels it'll drift sideways. So if you have omni wheels then I put it at 8. If you have traction wheels on your drive base I put it at 2 and since I have omni wheels I'll put 8. So these are the PID constants which I will tune in the next video and this is our odometry setup. So since we have a vertical tracking wheel, we'll include and vertical. But since we don't have a horizontal tracking wheel, we'll put null PTR. And we have an IMU, so we can just leave it at that. So in the next video, we'll tune these PID constants. So now we have Pipan to explain how the PID works. So for the PID controller, you have three components. You have P, I, and D. P stands for proportional controller, which means this value to be like very high. You want to make your robot move very fast. Okay. And then for the I controller, what it does is it will calculate all the error that's happened to your robot. You move your robot from point A to point B. And then you want to stop exactly at B point. So if you do not have any I gain or I, I component here. What your robot could do is it could move past the point B where you want to or it will stop before it reach point B. That's what the I does. So if you have the I component, it, the robot might possibly stop exactly at point B right here. As for the D derivative component, this one will reduce the speed of your robot. For example, it will look at the distance from A to B, right? And then it will predict what's the speed they would use when it's almost reach point B. For example, you might, if you have T and D gain and your P is very really high at point A here, right? And then as it move and it's across point B here, the robot will uh, slow down so that it will not oscillate past through point B. What would happen if you only have T and D controller here? You only have T and D. What would happen is at point A and B, your robot might go like this, start from point A and to B, and they will keep oscillating non-stop. So you want the D component to make the robot understand that it needs to slow down when it approach point B. And you need a DI component to make sure that it stops at exact location at point B. 
Okay, so in order to make sure that RPID tuning is fast, I recommend that you tape two white lines 10 inches apart from each other so that we can tell whether or not the robot is going the right distance. Now that we have our white lines, we can be sure that the robot's moving the right distance. So I recommend that you pair your robot to your controller first, and then you plug the USB from your controller into the computer because it will be much easier to upload wirelessly you can see that my controller is now linked to my robot the top right and now if i plug my controller into my computer i should get a message in the bottom right hand of my screen on vs code there it says my robot's connected and now we can start tuning the pid so like Fipon said we need to tune kp and kd first so I'll set all of these other parameters to zero so that we don't get any extra error while tuning. So we have two controllers for linear turning and for angular turning. So we have to tune one at a time. Once we set all of them to zero, we can scroll down here to autonomous. I will delete all of this code as we don't need it so we need to set the position to zero first so i'll reset it by putting chassis dot set pose zero 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 that sets x y to zero and theta to zero so now we can start tuning our linear controller. So we want it to move forward 10 inches as our tape line is 10 inches away. So I want it to move 10 inches forward because that's where our white tape line is. So I'll put chassis dot move to point zero for X, 10 for Y because we're moving 10 inches forward and then an infinite timeout so that we know what we need to change before it times out. So now that that's ready, we can go ahead and upload the project. I'll change this to programming PID and program slot free. And as always, I'll go here and then click build and upload to upload to my controller. So we can see that it reaches the right location, but there is no oscillation, meaning that we can up P. So now that we're in VS Code, you can go to Linear Controller and then you up your P gain. We can try 20. So the goal is to up P gain as much as you can until it starts oscillating. And then I'll show you what it looks like when it's oscillating. And once it does, we want to up D gain. So until it stops oscillating and then of P gain as much as we can until D gain doesn't stop it from oscillating. So the highest amount of KP possible This is the test with 20 P gain. You can see that it oscillated and it also didn't go to the right position. So we need to up D gain. I'll put it to 10. This is 20 KP, 10 KD. You can see that it's still oscillating, so we need more D gain. I'll put 18. So you want to repeat this until the highest amount of KP possible. KP 20, KD 18. Mm -hmm. We can see that it's still oscillating, meaning we have to increase KD more. KP20, KD28. KP20, KD38. So you can see that the, no matter how much KD we put, it's still oscillating, so we lowered KP. Now it's KP15, KD30. Light oscillation, so KP15, KD35. Still slight oscillation, so now it's KP13, KD35. Still a slight oscillation, so KP12, KD38. No oscillation, so KP12.5, KD36. 
Okay, so now that we know that 13 closes it to oscillate, but 12.5 doesn't, this is going to be our max KP. So this is going to be our final setting. So now that we're done with the linear controller, we're going to do the same for the rotational controller. So we need to change our command in our autonomous to move to turn to heading. So this will turn instead of move. And I'll set this to 180 so it does full rotation. Now we can try turning 180. This is KP2, KD10. No oscillation, so KP4, KD10. There's oscillation, so KP4, KD20. KP4, KD40. Still oscillating a lot, so KP3, KD40. KP2.5, KD30. KP2, KD15. KP2.2, KD15. KP2.35, KD15. KP2.35, KD20. Pretty good. So now we know that the max KP is somewhere between 2.35 and 2.5. That's going to be our final setting. So now we have the right values for our linear controller and our angular controller. And we'll go on to programming it in the next video.